This is a Geek Leader Podcast, and I'm your host, John Rauta. This show is all about helping us grow as leaders, become better technologists, and improve our lives both at work and at home. I hope you enjoy the show and learn a lot. Hello, world, and welcome to episode 192 of Geek Leader Podcast. I'm your host, John Rauta. And today's episode is sponsored by Live at Manning's Graph Data Science Conference. Now, if you're anything like me, a visual representation of data is very important, and nothing does it better than graphs. So please tune in to the Live at Manning Graph Data Science Conference this February 16th. That's coming up, guys, so February 16th to hear talks from data scientists explaining how, where, and why you should be using graph data to your advantage. You can register free by going to ageekleader.com slash graph. Again, that's ageekleader.com slash graph. And also, on any of the uh, Manning conference and events products, you can um, you can get a discount by using TC Graph 21 to get 35% off. So check that out as well. You can find more information about that at ageekleader.com slash graph. Thanks again, and don't forget to check out this live at Manning Graph Data Science Conference. All right, Geek Leaders, today on the show, I've got Jack Tompkins, and he is a partner and founder of Pineapple Consulting Firm, which is a company that helps uh, people like you and me uh, turn data into visualizations that will help clients and strategic partners. Um, And uh, Jack, uh, you're from Charlotte, which uh, is kind of cool because uh, I'm from Charlotte as well. Um, But if you don't mind, just tell the audience a little bit about kind of how you got started and what you're doing today. Absolutely. Thanks so much for having me. First off, John, nice to talk with another Charlotte and I guess we're called. Um, <laughs> I'm actually, I'm originally from Connecticut, um, which is not very exciting, but I worked for an insurance company there and went through a, a leadership program, uh, was an analyst in a couple different capacities and really liked it, but wanted to, you know, help the little guy, help the small business out. So I decided to use my powers for good and I started pineapple on the side and eventually became full-time. And that kind of coincided with me moving uh, down here to Charlotte. So was pineapple kind of one of the reasons why you moved to Charlotte or, or did you just like the weather better? <laughs> the weather was probably the main thing, honestly. <laughs> um, yeah. I mean, Charlotte's, Charlotte's a great city and we, we could talk probably the entire time on why it's a great city, but pineapple was, this is, this is a better city for business than where I was in Connecticut. Mm-hmm. So that was one reason. Um, and since I've been down here, it's definitely, there's just, there's a lot more opportunity down here and a lot more folks who are kind of speaking the same language. So it has definitely become one of the biggest reasons why I'll stay here for a while. Yeah. I think uh, Charlotte's kind of one of those hidden tech hubs that there's, um, you you know, you hear about, you know, Silicon Valley and and some of those other places, but Charlotte really has a lot of really good technology um, people, positions, uh, opportunities. It's uh, one of those great places. I actually live just outside of the city in in Fort Mill, but um, you know, it's a fantastic place. Yeah, absolutely. There's, uh, it seems like there's a new company moving here almost every week. So yes, yeah, yeah. everybody's starting to catch on. So let me ask you um, a question when it comes to what exactly is data visualization and how would, you know, let's say a middle manager or a CIO or, or somebody like me um, in technology use, use some of your services? Yeah, it's a great question. So data is data, right? Everybody's kind of familiar with that, but the visualization piece is what is my favorite piece about data because looking at even just something like an Excel spreadsheet with endless columns and rows and black and white numbers, you know that there's really good stuff in there. It's just hard to see at a glance. So the visualization piece takes all of that data that's in the massive columns and rows or in a data warehouse or something like that. And it puts it into charts, graphs, KPIs and indicators and things like that. So you can look at it at a glance and your brand colors are there. You get, you know, the giant green arrow up if you're doing good and the red arrow down if you're doing bad. Um, it kind of helps bring everything, everything to the surface and bring your data to life. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, so, you know, for someone that's kind of geeky and technical, I like to look <laughs> at data. I like numbers. But a lot of the people that I have to work with in the business, you know, when I'm collaborating with, let's say, someone from marketing or sales, they might not like the, the straight, you know, numbers the way I do. So what are some ways that we can kind of uh, make those numbers tell a good story? Yeah, it's, it's such a good example. Um, 
for, for dealing with the folks that, like you said, whether they're in sales and marketing, they're no, they don't want to get into the weeds or they're, if you're like the leader of the company and you simply don't have time. I found this mm-hmm. in the corporate world and, and in my life now too. Um, I deal with a lot of entrepreneurs, solopreneurs, fairly small companies, and they might absolutely love data, but they just don't have the time. So it really comes down to putting um, the data that they want to see into a usable form so they can look at it and get the story and you can guide their eyes, literally guide their eyes to whatever the story may be with, with, like I said, the charts and the graphs and the indicators. Mm -hmm. So what are some examples of, of, you know, a, um, a technical leader that you have, you know, using some of these, these uh, visualizations when it comes to data, what are some success stories that you've seen, you know, driving forward to be able to communicate a little bit more effectively than just going out and just saying a bunch of numbers? Sure. Right. Um, I'll give, uh, I'll give two examples. The first being a company that uh, was kind of inherently data driven. It's in the, like the logistics world. Um, so obviously there's like a huge technology component to that and a huge data component to that. Cause everything is just, uh, kind of playing with the margins in that industry. So they didn't have a great system for tracking the data or, or using their internal data. Um, so what we did was we put together uh, what we call like dashboards or scorecards. And it kind of, like I mentioned in the beginning, kind of brought the data to life because you can see with each of the different clients that they work with or, or carriers or um, whatever they were uh whatever they should be called there, you can see with each of those different carriers, what is working and what is not working, where they might need to improve, where they're doing great and can focus somewhere else or focus on profitability or, you know, something like that. Mm -hmm. So we were doing things like putting speedometers in there. So I forget some of the metrics, but something like, uh, I don't know, total miles driven. We'll use that as an example because that's uh, very equivalent to like revenue in that industry. So total miles driven, you can have a speedometer of like completely green. You're driving an awesome amount of miles because it's bringing an awesome amount of revenue. Or it could be on the red side of the speedometer and hey, like, you know, do you have enough drivers to meet the miles or why is this number low? So that was example one of kind of, I don't want to say starting from scratch because it's not right, but starting from scratch in terms of visualization and Mm -hmm. getting something into that really nice form where they can bring it to their internal team or their clients and say, look, here's, here's what's, here's what's happening between us. Here's what's happening in our businesses. Here's what's working and here's what's not working. So that was a really fun example to kind of get them off the ground with. Yeah. So when when you're looking at things that are working, so you have to capture that data first, right? Because I know exactly. sometimes you look at some small businesses and they're not, I mean, they have all the data, but they don't even know where it's at. They're not, they're not collecting it in, in any meaning, right. <laughs> meaningful fashion. And I know back when I used to build uh, websites for people and uh, mobile apps for, for companies and stuff, you know, analytics was something we always baked into it. And it was amazing how many small business owners would be like, I have no idea how much traffic I get on my site. I have no right. idea how many, you know, and, and it's like, So how does one go about figuring out what data you need to track? Because from a security point, you know, perspective where, where I'm kind of sitting now, I'm kind of concerned about capturing all the data, right? Because we have, you know, the California Privacy Act, we have GDPR, and we want to make sure we're not keeping too much, but what do we figure out? What, what is that data we actually need to have and what is too much? Yeah, it's, it's such a good question. Um, a lot of what I deal with is, is financially based. So obviously security is a big concern there, but it really comes down to things that they already have. So in the financial case, it's dealing with the QuickBooks of the world or whatever software they use. Mm-hmm. You know, 99% of small businesses have some sort of accounting software and it's where they keep at least the majority of their financials. So that's a great place to start of just using something that you inherently use every day, but might not take full advantage of. Mm -hmm. Another one is marketing. Um, Like you said, the the traffic Google analytics is a great free tool. You can get a whole bunch of good info from that. Um, Where I would say you might get into the too much data is if you're tracking kind of, and this will be broad, but if you're tracking every little thing that the company does from, 
you know, I talked to this person from this company for 42 and a half minutes and we did not get a sale from it and things like that. When you get too granular, then you can get into all sorts of things, analysis paralysis and looking at too many things. And uh, there, there's a lot of good that can come from granularity, but you can <laughs> definitely get too granular. So let's say we have our data, you know, and, you know, whether you're using QuickBooks or, or Great Plains or something like that to actually capture your, your sales and your financial information. How do, how do we go about building that dashboard that you talked about? What are some of the tools that someone would use or, or how would they go about getting that started and figuring out what the needs are of the CEO or the executives to see some of that data? Right. There's, there's a couple of different options. And I would say one option to start off is check with whoever you're reporting to. If you, if you are the leader of the company, what do you want to look at? Or if you're, it's meant to uh, kind of be a report to the leader of the company, see what's important to them. If it's financials uh, or if it's marketing or whatever it is, try and get the KPIs to start because that'll drive everything. Mm. Places I like to, or softwares I like to use. Um, honestly, Excel is probably number one for me because most small businesses are in Excel and they're familiar with it. And obviously there's flaws with it in terms of security and uh, data storage. It can only hold so much. If you're just dealing with things like QuickBooks data, um, Excel can go a really long way in a, in a you know, fairly short amount of work ever. Mm-hmm. So I like using that if the customer likes using it. Another one is Google Data Studio, which I've kind of just been tapping into recently. But as far as I can tell, it's completely free and it can, it's got a whole bunch of built-in APIs that connect to wherever your financials are, whatever, I, we keep using that as an example, but wherever, whatever data uh, is stored, there's probably an API that can hook into at least Google Sheets and then Google Sheets can go into Google Data Studio. Um, and then the last piece, or maybe the, the third ranked priority on my list is Tableau, um, which is sort of the all-in robust, uh, obviously more expensive option too. Mm-hmm. So I've never heard of uh, Google Data Studio, so I'm, I'm kind of looking that up right now. Um, yeah. What are some of the things that come out of it? So you have your Google Sheets that feed the data into it, but what, what are you seeing out of it? So it is, it's very similar to the Tableaus and the Power BIs of the world. Mm-hmm. It can probably do... I don't know, I'd estimate like 70% of the same type of work as Tableau. Um, it's, it's similar to Tableau. It's not really great for manipulating the data. Mm. Um, what I kind of like about it is one, it's free. Two, you can embed it into other sites. So even if the person doesn't have a Google account, you can embed it. Like I have a few reports hidden on my website. Um, that's a really nice feature. And everything will kind of be able to be dumped into Google Sheets and you can do manipulation or even a little bit of analysis there if you need to. But the bottom line is it can connect to a lot of things much like Tableau. Um, It can auto refresh much like Tableau. There are some limitations on the analysis side and the visual side, but at the end of the day, it gets to the same end of putting the numbers into a nice visual for the CEO or the leader to look at at a glance and get the story. So one interesting thing, uh, I just went to Google Data Studio as we we're talking, and when I clicked on it, it brought up um, my school's, uh, my kids' school, uh, their COVID dashboard is in Google Data Studio. Oh, really? <laughs> they have all their COVID reporting cases and all that good stuff. I was like, oh, that's kind of cool. That, as soon as I pulled one there, you kind of pulled that up as one of my examples. Oh, that's really neat. Yeah, <laughs> that makes sense. <laughs> yeah, so uh, it sounds like that's kind of a product that a lot of companies are starting to look at and, and maybe move to. Uh, that's pretty cool. I want to I want to talk a little bit about some of the um, the things that I did in the past when I was first managing a team and trying to um, uh, get my team more known within a company. This was a, a little bit larger of a, of a company, and um, it's probably been, you know, gosh, 10 years ago now or longer. Um, and I took over this team. It was a web and mobile development team, and we were, you know, just starting out on mobile apps. We were kind of also in charge of our corporate websites and internal web, web applications and tools. And no one knew anybody on my team as far as the rest of the company, right? We were, <laughs> we were one of those groups that's known in IT and unknown everywhere else. Gotcha. And I wanted to, to figure out how I could use some of the things that we're doing to kind of toot our own horn and market ourselves a little bit within the company. And um, 
I was at church one Sunday and the church that I went to, that I go to had a, um, um, an annual report that they put out. And I've always thought annual reports are boring. They're just, you know, a bunch of numbers about how much people have given and stuff like that. Right. But this year, the church kind of did it differently. They, they did a, it was a web version of an annual report and it was all animated and they had like things like, um, uh, number of hours served, number of, uh, cups of coffee, you know, at in Sunday <laughs> service, you know, kind of, kind of some funny things, some, some cool things. And then the bigger picture impact stories being told, like number of salvations, number of um, meals served at, at this event and things like that. And it's kind of like, oh, maybe I can take that same kind of strategy and use it for my team. So what we did is we spent the last uh, week and a half of the year, basically just compiling data from things that we did, like number of code pushes throughout the year, number of bug fixes, um, new customers that started using our system since, you know, the beginning of the year to net till now. So it's kind of showing the growth. Um, uh, and then we did some funny stuff, like how many, uh, K cups we used as a team. Um, yeah. uh, we had two people on the team get married. So we did like weddings and things like that. Okay. We, we put some fun stuff in there and, um, without much expectation of what this is going to come out, turn out to be, I sent it out to, um, our CEO and our CIO and a CFO, just different people, leaderships within the team. And kind of said, Hey, I just want to show you some of the things our team has been working on. Um, let us know if there's things that you would like us to focus on in the, the next year. And um, we got such great feedback from this and people were like, I had no idea your team was doing all this work. And they were so you know thankful and, and the gratitude, you know, that we got back was pretty, pretty amazing. Um, how could, you know, maybe a new manager, take some of these ideas and use this to kind of manage their team to kind of show the progress. Cause a lot of times what I see is that they're, they're so focused on actually getting the job done. No one knows what they're actually doing. Right. <laughs> it's so true too. Cause it, whether you're in the biggest company in the world or on the smaller side, it can sometimes be just like that order taker department, this black box that nobody else really understands. Yeah. So I think what you're doing is awesome. I think that is a really cool way to do it and have some fun with data too, with the, with the K cups and, and things like that, because data can be fun. And I think it's important to show that. Mm -hmm. um, I, I really like what you're doing because like I said, AT is just sort of this black box for folks that don't know it. And, and I've been on the other side of the equation too, where, you know, we needed a new product rollout when I was in my corporate role and it was, we go to IT and say, here's what we need. Just get it done. I don't care how you get it done. And I'm not going to understand how you get it done anyways. So let me know when it's going to be done and I'm going to come to you if it breaks. And that was it. Mm -hmm. But there's so much more behind the scenes doing, like you said, the code pushes and, and putting those numbers out there. It, it kind of like we said, well, I mentioned in the beginning too, it, it brings it to life and it almost demystifies that IT environment of, hey, look, here's what we're doing. And we're not going to throw a bunch of just numbers at you, like you said, the that the annual church report used to be. Because that's just, it's still kind of like, okay, I'm rolling my eyes because it's IT and they're showing me a bunch of numbers. Mm -hmm. But you get a nice visual, you get some fun uh, pieces of data in there. And people that don't normally live in the IT world start to get a better sense of holy crap you know that's why we invest so much in technology because they're doing all of these different things and you can show you know we did a hundred code pushes and it helped um the product side of the house or the marketing side of the house do x y and z and so it's it's nice to one put it into a honestly a digestible and kind of a normal quote unquote format and two show what it does for the other departments, which my favorite, of course, very biased is putting it into the visuals. Like you mentioned, I think it's perfect. Mm -hmm. I think the visuals are so important just to, you know, like you said, if it's just numbers, people are going to go and gloss over from them. But when you have like a graph or something that shows the trend, you know, and you can see the, the trend line going up, you know, when we, when we did it, uh, when, one of the years we did um, a, uh, a piece of uh, development to try to encourage people to go paperless with their billing. Okay. So instead of us milling out, you know, 250,000 bills every month, we want to see how many people we can convert to paperless. We did a little promotion and, you know, you say, oh, we got, you know, 70,000 customers paperless. What does that mean? Well, let's take that a step further. Let's figure out how, what the dollar savings is of that and how that grows month over month, because it's not just a one-time savings. It's a every month savings kind of thing. Right. And you can kind of show the growth of that and the trend lines. You say, oh, okay. So that's not just a one number of 70,000. It's a trend of each month. It's more and more and more and growing exponentially. And um, I think, I think when you see that as a visual representation of a chart or a graph or something like that, it makes a bigger difference than just 80,000 people. 
Oh, absolutely. I couldn't agree more. Trendline is was one of my favorite things to use. And if Excel is my best friend, then, you know, trend lines are my second best friend because I, <laughs> I absolutely love them and, and showing them to the, to the owners because it, it does. It, it shows, look, here's where it started. Here's where we are now. And doing like the 70,000 of customers convert, I think that's perfect. And you can do like the sort of the fill the thermometer bowl or, or bar, oh, yeah. of, you know, we're at 70 out of 120. And then everybody ro- really wants to fill up the entire bar. And then you show the trend saving over time too. It's, it's a really nice pairing. I, I love that. So that kind of brings me to my next question is kind of how can this visualization of data kind of play on the psyche of people, you know, when they see it, how does that change the way that they feel about it? Like you mentioned the, the thermometer wanting to, you know, sprint to get to that end, you know, to meet that goal. How, how does the, the visual aspect make a difference there? Yeah, it's, you know, I was, I was talking to somebody the other day and it's almost like a gamification of data. Um, whether it's, you're trying to hit a budget number, you're trying to hit a hundred percent of folks subscribed to emails instead of uh, snail mail, direct mm-hmm. mail. Um, there's a bit of a gamification that plays with the psyche of, Ooh, you know, I, I really want to hit my budget. So that arrow is going to turn green and I'm going to, I'm going to beat it by 5% or I really want to fill up the bar and it keeps people engaged, which is really, it's, I mean, it's no small thing because the more folks are engaged with the numbers and looking at it, um, the more they're going to manage to it, right? That's whatever the saying is that, which is monitored is managed, something like that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, the more they're engaged with it and looking at it, it helps them stay on, tr- on track. Um, it, I mean, it, enough can't be said. It's, it's kind of hard to quantify uh, which stinks for us being numbers driven folks, but <laughs> <laughs> there is definitely something in the psyche that uh, people just want to look at the pretty colors and the pretty graphs, honestly. Yeah, absolutely. And I think uh, whenever you see the, the reports that look good, you think they're better numbers than maybe they really are sometimes. <laughs> right. <laughs> it's exactly right. Yeah. <laughs> Um, and that's one of the things I've tried to make a, a, a point to do, not only just uh, and going back to when you can practically use this as a as an IT leader or manager, you know, you may do those annual reports, but it's also good whenever you're going in front of the boss and you have a budget, you know, you're going to present your budget, you want to ask right. for money for, for a project or not, show some visualizations that you, you know, return on investments is a, is a huge one, but but also if, if maybe it's a, uh, what we call our tech debt project where there's not going to be much return on investment um, that you can, you know, quantify in a, in a dollar amount. You can show it in other ways. You can show it in time. You can show it in um, uh, lines of cleanup code. Like what, what, you know, before we were working with, you know, 10,000 lines of code. Now we're working with 2000 and kind of represent that with like bar, bar chart or something where you can see like a huge line and a small line. And say, this is, you know, how we simplified and we're focusing on the essentials and things like that. Yeah. Oh, that's perfect. Um, the, uh, the, you know, IT is oftentimes it's sort of an expense center. The ROI mm-hmm. is a bit tough to quantify in some uh, instances, but if you're going asking for two hundred thousand dollars, that's a big scary number for a lot of businesses to uh, quote. You know, not to use this word, but like to dump into IT, right? Because that's kind of the right. mentality that might take on. But you put it that into a pie graph, then, and you say, "Look, here's this little slice that's going to fixing the code to make sure that we don't lose money over time." Here's this little slice that's going into investments. So whatever, the customer can have a better experience. And you kind of spike it out like that. And it becomes this, okay, it's not 200,000. It's 50,000 plus 75 plus 20. And it, it becomes, okay, there's, you guys are doing a whole lot with this. And it takes on, I, I'm really being a dead horse now, takes on a new life. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I think it, it also shows um, a little bit of that business acumen that a lot of tech leaders have, but they don't really express sometimes. Um, and I go back to one of the guests I had a while back was Mark Schwartz, and, and he wrote a book, uh, War, Peace, and IT. He talks a lot about having how IT needs to have a seat at the table when it comes to making some of those strategic business decisions. And a lot of times, for my preferences, you know, you may have CIO that reports up to the CFO, which, uh, you know, whether it's good or bad, I don't know, but I really think that CIO and CTO need to report directly to the CEO and have a seat at that table with all the other C-levels because they bring something and an element of understanding when it comes to how the different groups work together. And if you can represent that in a way 
that shows that you understand the ROI aspect, you understand the communication aspect and how this group works with this group and how you're kind of in the middle of in, 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 you know, facilitating some of those uh, pathways. Um, it, it shows a lot more business acumen for that leader and for their group. Yeah, it's such a good point. I, I love that. And I like, I might be a little bit more IT literate than the average person, but there's a whole lot of people that are much more IT than me and much more business than me. So if you're able to show both sides of that equation, I absolutely think that uh, one, it without a doubt deserves a seat at the table because anything that you do these days, there pretty much has to be an IT component to it. So why not give them a seat at the table to say how likely it is, how easy it's going to be, how difficult it's going to be. I think, I think it'd be strange to not have a seat at the table, honestly. Um, and I say that again, I'm putting on my previous hat when IT was a black box to me, they still need to be in that conversation. And is this even possible? Is this a quick thing? Is this easy? What does it mean for the future? Can we update it? All those questions, everybody wants a specific answer without the IT person at the table. It's tough to get that specific answer that is a necessary answer to have. Yeah, and I have to say I've been I've been lucky enough to you know the last couple of companies that I've worked for where IT has had that seat, which is which is excellent. But I hear cool. so many stories talking to to other leaders in, in uh, technology where they don't have that opportunity, and um, it, it's kind of one of those things. Well, well, how do you get that opportunity? You need to you know show that you're you're. I don't want to. This sounds kind of bad, but show that you're worthy of that opportunity. <laughs> and one of the ways to do that is to have good data and be able to present it really well in, in a way that makes sense to everybody and show the importance of your actual role. And that, you know, there's been so many times where I've heard stories of the whole business coming together, coming up with this great plan and then throwing it over the fence to IT to make it happen. And they have right. <laughs> yeah, I, I, it's, it's so well said. Um, it's demonstrating that value. And it's, it is a weird way to say, but like show your worthiness. And, uh, you know, it might, be, might not be the best phrasing, but everybody in the company has to show that to some extent. Right. And so IT is no different. And the easiest way to right. do that is kind of what we started talking about was putting the data into visuals and make it so everybody at the table can understand. Mm -hmm. So one of the things that I did want to hit, hit on a little bit was um, you talk, you mentioned earlier about financial data is kind of one of the, the areas that you work with a good bit. Mm -hmm. And um, for me, that's always been an, an important part of technology is, is looking at the financial data and how we impact finance. And I would say, you know, from, I think the vice president of technology's best friend needs to be the vice president of finance, right? right. You guys need to work really close together um, and, and help them understand the data because that's, that's kind of the, the lifeblood of the company, right? The, the finances. Yeah. And um, how can, how have you seen um, a benefits from the financial side whenever you can actually see the end to end results, you know, maybe the, the data that's there that no one's looking at. Um, what are some examples that you've seen that, that have really made a difference in, in a company? Right. It's, um, it's, it's kind of neat because you can take it, you can take a look at the financials and you can say, all right, there's money in the bank at the end of this month. So we probably had a good month. Um, obviously that's a great thing, but there's so much more to it. And I think everybody's aware of that. Mm -hmm. What you find when you dig into that data is you can uncover some good stuff that honestly can kind of mold your strategy. And that's a lot of what I do with folks is put those numbers into the dashboards that bring out not just the revenue and profit, although I think that's a great place to start in terms of visual visualization. And especially if you're kind of tackling it on your own, but getting deeper into the numbers and instead of looking at the boring black and white PL statement, you can see the things uh, let's go with, I don't know, uh, certain expenses, like a percent of revenue. You can kind of dive into that and say, if it's growing exponentially, let's say it's IT. If the IT expense is growing exponentially and so is your revenue, okay, that's pretty cool. There might be a correlation there. Honestly, there probably is. If IT is growing exponentially and revenue is not growing in tandem at all, then maybe you want to shift your investment. Maybe it's into marketing or a different area of IT. So things like that, they're, they're all in there it's a whole lot easier to see in a dashboard and you can take that and say, okay, this worked, this did not work. Let's change it up or let's keep going because everything is working really well. It's obviously the ideal case and it does happen. Um, so yeah, there's, there's a whole lot of good info in, in the financial statements. It's just being able to actually see what's happening. 
I think that percentage of, uh, of revenue is, is, a, is a cool one to look at. I know one of the things that I, I've looked at before when I was trying to pitch, um, I, I can go back a few years ago when I was pitching Office 365 and trying to get, you know, moved over to that. And it's uh, you going from that capital expense of once every two or three years when you upgrade Office to the now it's a monthly operational expense. Mm -hmm. um, I used that that percentage of revenue and I said, you know, well, this whole year's worth of Office 365 is one and a half days worth of revenue. Like, right. <laughs> <laughs> and when you break it down that way, okay, it doesn't sound that bad. Right. Right. And you can, you can put an ROI on that too. Look, spend a day and a half of revenue and everybody's familiar with it. You get to use all of the different 365 features that everybody knows and likes and is used to. You could kind of quantify it with that too. So I, I think that's great. Yeah. Yeah, but I really like that percentage of revenue that you that you threw in there. Um, how have you guys used data like from the human side? Have you worked with any like uh, human resources or things to, to represent maybe turnover rate? Because I know in technology, that's kind of one of the big things to talk about is turnover. And especially um, here in Charlotte, we've got, you know, it's a big financial system. We've got banks, we've got Microsoft, we've got lots of companies here that, that do have um they're, they're bidding really hard to try to get those developers to come in and work for them. And you see a lot of, of software development contractors kind of bounce around and you, you see companies with high turnover rates. Have you ever done anything with data to kind of express the human data? I have done just a little bit, but I've, I've read plenty of reports and, and talked with other folks who are doing it. And to your point, like in the IT world or in the HR world, there's a whole lot of good info there and it might not be the, you know, hard data, the financials, that's revenue and profit, but it might mm -hmm. be, like you said, employee turnover or employee satisfaction. Mm -hmm. um, that's another one that you can still put into something that is digestible and I'll keep pushing dashboards. Um, the HR uh, uh, department that I used to work with in the corporate world, they had their own dashboards too. And a lot of it was that human factor that can kind of be tough to quantify, but you can still put some numbers around it. Or even if it's employee sat satisfaction and you've got, you know, the frowny face, the medium face and the happy face, you can put some numbers to say, okay, 75% of people put the happy face, not necessarily a number with the happy face, but you can show generally people like working here. Um, yeah, there, there's a whole lot of good data in there too. And like I said, I haven't done a whole lot of it myself, um, but there's a huge opportunity for it. And I think that's probably one of the more untapped markets uh, that is yet to feel the full force of the data. Yeah, I think so too. I know I don't I don't see it you know at a lot of companies that that I've been at and worked with, but I have on a few you know seen um, you know some some job postings or things like that, and you go look at it, and they have some metrics about. Um, employee satisfaction, like you mentioned, turnover rate, uh, uh, average growth of, uh, of of an employee over a period of time. So you see like, oh, well, employees typically get X amount of percentage of raise over the, the, the five years they're with the company or something like that, which are kind of cool stats that encourage you to want to apply at that place versus somewhere else where you don't really know. Right. Yeah. Making those numbers available. Um, it, it definitely has an impact, especially like you said, if you're trying to attract talent. Um, it's great to talk to the interviewer and the interviewer that works for the company says, Oh, it's a great place to work. But if you can get some data that says, okay, this person, this interviewer is one of many people who think it's a great place to work. Then mm -hmm. that's a, that's a much bigger, much more impactful statement. Absolutely. So when it comes to data and creating these dashboards, do you have any, um, any ever get any pushback of people that don't want the transparency or that, or, or what, do you, what is your opinion on transparency of data? Um, I think it depends on the size of company. Um, a lot of the folks that I work with, like I said, are on the, on the much smaller side, I think like a hundred employees or less. And so for the most part, it's a pretty transparent organization. Um, I, I like that. I think there's definitely a scenario where, not all of the numbers should be shared with everybody. Um, and it's not necessarily like, oh, they're going to take these numbers and go run to a competitor. Some of it is, you know, the C-suite of the organization saying, here's what you should focus on, uh, Mr. or Mrs. Salesperson. Here's your numbers. Here's your region's numbers, whatever it is. You don't really need to be concerned with the ROI on IT spend. So... I, I do like the transparency. I think you can get lost in it. Um, 
unfortunately my answer is kind of a soft one of just it, it's probably a probably a case by case situation but i would err on the side of transparency and have uh, some confidence or trust that the folks that shouldn't be you know straying too far out of their lane won't stray too far out of their lane right and that's one of the things that i, I like about um where I work today is that there's that transparency to where, you know, we're going to have a monthly or quarterly meeting where they're going to talk about uh, the numbers and how well we're doing, what are, what are revenues looking like compared to goal, you know, so as a whole, everybody kind of knows where the company stands. We know if we're on solid ground or, you know, like maybe at the beginning of COVID where things were really confused and we didn't know how things were going to play out. We knew, you know, kind of where we stood going through that whole part. And uh, not too long ago, I had to go and um, do some consulting work at a company. And I met with the employees and the company's in a really bad place uh, financially. And, you know, meeting with the employees, they had no idea until the layoff started, you know, like not even clear. Wow. They thought they were doing great. And it's like, well, how, how is that unaware? Like, how did you not know that for the last, you know, several, for, for quite a while, you guys have been <laughs> purging money and dipping right. way deep into savings. And, and um, you know, it, it was shocking to kind of see that the, the employees had no clue. And, uh, you know, I, I agree with you err on the side of transparency, but sometimes, you know, you, you can be vague in your transparency too. You know, you don't have to give right. all the numbers, but you can give enough to get people and give an idea of where we're at. Right. Actually, I'm, the more that we talk about this, I'm, I'm leaning even more towards the side of transparency. Yeah. Um, cause even for the, for the folks who don't know what we'll keep using the it black box as an example, people have no idea what they're doing, but then they get some transparency into the CIO reports, um, mm -hmm. it kind of gives them an appreciation of, okay, these aren't just like some break fix Wi-Fi fixers. They're actually like doing a whole lot to contribute to the company. And the reason that we are growing is because we have this great IT. So it, it could open up the doors to some greater appreciation across the company too. Yeah, absolutely. I think you're hundred percent right. And I know um, I was kind of amazed when I came to the place where I am now and was leading the, the technology group that you'd go and meet with people and they think everybody in your team just fixes computers. <laughs> and right. realize that, no, no, these people are, are doing application you know, development. These people are, are working on your network uh, operations. They're different things. They just think everybody fixes computers and that's all you do. Right. Exactly. Everybody's just help desk. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And uh, so I, I think that's a great idea of, of being transparent about your numbers and putting them out there. Um, and making sure that people are aware of, of what's out there. So what are some ways that, let's say, a leader um, in technology can put those numbers out there and make them accessible without coming off like they're, you know, all braggy braggy? Right. <laughs> uh, at the end of the day, it, uh, a lot of that comes down to tone. And that's sometimes hard to do when presenting data. Um, but at the end of the day, the facts are the facts. Um, if you're able to say, look, you know, we, we helped grow the company by another 20% this year. I think there's, this is where the kind of the human element of data comes in, where you can say, look, here are the numbers and, you know, we were awesome, but we didn't do it alone. We got help from our partners and, and across organization and, and things like that. So I think, I think there's different ways to present it that make it not braggy braggy, or if it's really bad, not uh, you know, putting it more in the dumps. Um, for a lot of that, that's where the human piece comes in. And like we we're talking about earlier, the CIO that has that business acumen, that's that ideal person to do that presentation or, or at least uh, give recommendations for building the report if it's something that's just kind of on the company website or something. Um, it's it's kind of nice because everybody is becoming more data driven. It's not to say that like the gut instinct is going away or that human element of it. You kind of need both. And I think that's a really good example of where you do need both. Yeah, I think you're absolutely right. Well, Jack, this has been a great conversation. How can people um, find out more about the things that you're working on and connect with you and learn more about data visualization and maybe even learn how to use Excel to its fullest? Yeah, <laughs> I'm always up for an Excel conversation or anything else, honestly. <laughs> um, no, this has been an absolute blast, John. Thanks so much. Like I said, I was, I was looking forward to this for a while because uh, getting to nerd out about this stuff is, is a whole lot of fun to me. Um, best way to reach me is probably just head to my website. I've got examples on there. I've got services, success stories, ways to contact me. So head over to uh, Pineapple CF, as in Pineapple Consulting Firm, dot com. And that's probably a great place to start. All right. Let me ask you one quick question. 
where did the name pineapple come come, come from? <laughs> you know, I think I get that question every time. <laughs> um, well, yeah, you're you're in the Charlotte area, you get it. Um, yep. It's a uh, it's kind of the welcoming sign, right? We're in the south, mm-hmm. so when you get a new neighbor, you're supposed to give them a pineapple. Um, you know, I didn't. I my the background of my website is a pineapple on a beach, and uh, for one, it's not like the generic sort of sk- cityscape consultant company, um, but it's also meant to kind of symbolize vacation a bit. Because if I could help a, another business save enough time or make enough money so that they could take that vacation when they're drinking a pina colada out of a pineapple on a beach, um, that would just be that'd be awesome for me. So that's it's kind of all symbolized by the pineapple for me. Yeah, and we didn't talk about this today, but I know one of the things you, you focus on too is also automating those reports and those data, so you don't have to right. you know, manually create things. And I think that's another uh, you know lead into where that pineapple comes from. Exactly. Yep. Save them some time. Well, I really appreciate having you on the show. And people, you can find out links to all these uh, to uh, Jack's website and YouTube, all at geekleader.com. And um, again, thanks so much. Thank you, John. This been this was awesome. If you enjoyed that episode please uh, leave a rating and review in apple Podcasts. i'd greatly appreciate that and also don't forget to check out merch we have some t-shirts that uh, i've designed that are on at um, you can click on the merchandise uh, section there and check that out and also don't forget about the books from our guests so if you like this guest and other guests that have written books please um, go ahead and check that out at a i would greatly appreciate it and i'm sure they would too